Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. That's our latest Queen Elizabeth Scholarship webinar coming to you from the McMaster Health Forum here at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. An agenda for today's presentation, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the McMaster Health Forum, a little bit about the Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, and then I'm going to turn it over to our Queen Elizabeth Scholar, Michael, who's going to be talking about the work that he did while he was at the Sachs Institute in Australia. The McMaster Health Forum is a leading hub for improving health outcomes through collective problem solving. It harnesses information, convenes stakeholders, and prepares action-oriented leaders, and acts as an agent of change by empowering stakeholders. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program is run by a partnership between the Rideau Hall Foundation, Community Foundations of Canada, Universities of Canada, and individual Canadian universities. The purpose is to activate a dynamic community of young global leaders across the Commonwealth to create lasting impacts both at home and abroad through cross-cultural exchanges encompassing international education, discovery and inquiry, and professional experiences. The Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program, as offered by the McMaster Health Forum, is called Strengthening Health Systems. Our scholars will contribute to strengthening health systems and become part of our large and growing network of health system leaders. We've had two cohorts of scholars so far. Uh, on the screen now is a list of our uh, scholars from our first cohort who primarily went away in 2016. And this is a list of our second cohort of scholars who primarily went away in 2017. And Michael is one such scholar who will be joining us in momentarily. And this is our speaker for today, Michael. Uh, at the time of his internship, he was uh, a BHC undergraduate student here at McMaster University. The goal of his in for his internship was to broaden his scope of work by working to translate research into tangible policy for the sake of strengthening health systems. He aimed to explore the relationship between research, policy, and practice as it relates to varying health systems. Uh, he is currently a student, still here at McMaster University, but currently in the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine. And that picture is the happiest picture we have of all of our scholars. And Michael always has a smile on his face, as he does right now. And I will turn it over to you. Here you go, Mike. <laughs> All right. So uh, thank you, James, for the introduction. So uh, as he was saying, so my name is Michael uh, K. Parvijan. Uh, I just graduated from the Health Sciences Program, and I've been kind of a couple months into my medicine program now. So uh, if I end up doing my residency here, I think I'm going to end up being a lifer here at Mac. <laughs> so that's what's going on. Um, so before we start, uh, I want to do something called the land acknowledgement. Um, so um, while they are becoming more common in current times, uh, for any of you out there kind of who haven't kind of heard them before, um, you can kind of just think about it just in a very simple term as a, a recognition of the original inhabitants of the land uh, and the fact that uh, we um, are as outsiders, uh, work, live, and grow on the land that uh, was not originally ours. And the fact that we were able to do so is a product of the colonialistic processes of uh, those that came before us. So while the land acknowledgement is in no great way actually changes the past, it can be one small part of uh, the greater process of reconciliation, uh, bringing to the forefront current issues facing Canada's First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples, as well as other First Peoples around the world. So I'm definitely not pretending to be any sort of expert on the subject, however, and I do encourage you to kind of look into it personally, uh, kind of, and learn more yourself. So first, I would like to recognize that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, acknowledged in the dish with one spoon wampum belt. Uh, that wampum uses the symbolism of a dish to represent the territory, and one spoon to represent that the people are to share the resources of the land and only take what they need. Um, because I also did my internship abroad in uh, Sydney, Australia, I would also like to acknowledge the ancestral owners of the land on which my work was conducted, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, upon whose ancestral land uh, the university was built. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for the land. So I'm just going to give you a quick overview of what I'm going to be talking about today. So um, I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, one of my projects that I worked on this summer. Uh, it was a review of the mental health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders youth at school entry. So just kind of, I'm going to figure out, switching slides here. All right. Um, so kind of the outline for uh, the presentation today is I'm just going to quickly go over what the Sachs Institute was. So that's where I did my internship. Uh, give you a bit of uh, context, uh, both historical and kind of current uh, in Australia, realizing that most of the people kind of here are probably Canadian um, and so may not have a great understanding of that. And then I'm going to talk about kind of the project itself. So um, the Sachs Institute, um, so I'm going to read their mission statement. I feel like it's easier. They, they know themselves best. Uh, and that's to improve health and well-being by driving the use of research and policies, programs, and services. Uh, we want wiser decisions for a healthy, aus healthier Australia. So that sounds kind of uh, pretty good. It's pretty broad. So what the Sachs Institute actually is, it's a 
It's a bunch of different divisions, research assets, uh, and collaboratives kind of coming together towards this common goal. Um, there are kind of a variety of different departments and kind of uh, divisions. I just listed a couple here that are pertinent. So uh, Knowledge Exchange was kind of where I was housed in Sydney, Australia, at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, but I was also working with the SEARCH team. So SEARCH stands for the Study on Environment on Aboriginal Resilience and Child Health. Um, and then uh, uh, TAPS, so T-A-P-P-C, which is the Australian Prevention Partnership Center. I put it up there in case some of you actually saw Jean's presentation from a month ago. That's where she was working down in Melbourne in their Melbourne office. So um, just to kind of give you some uh, insight, so the Knowledge Exchange kind of division where I worked um, kind of aims to assist decision makers in using uh, existing resources and to make more effective uh, use of the resources they already have. Um, they do things uh, such as uh, conducting rapid reviews of existing research evidence, which is something similar to what the Health Forum does, uh, which is why I kind of thought that was a pertinent example, but they do a bunch of different uh, kind of uh, services kind of in that kind of general field. All right, so um, I'm going to be getting into a little bit of historical context here just so that we can kind of follow what's going on today. So the first inhabitants of Australia were the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples. Um, so these first peoples are actually uh, known as the longest continuous living culture in the world. So they were kind of, think of them as the kind of longest continuous culture uninterrupted by kind of outside kind of influences. And kind of just that alone can kind of tell you a lot about how deep and rich the culture and kind of the traditions of the people are. Um, because I realize that this presentation is going to be largely for Canadian people uh, watching it, uh, I'm going to try and make a lot of parallels to Canadian First, Canadian first Peoples, so the First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, uh, just, you know, kind of to mediate understanding, but do recognize that there are obviously a lot of differences between the two. Now, in Canada, we have this kind of concept of uh, residential schools. So that was kind of, uh, kind of uh, policies. Uh, that came about, uh, kind of violent colonialistic policies that resulted in children being taken, taken away uh, from their communities, so First Nations children, uh, and put in these schools. So uh, there was kind of a lot of abuse going on in these schools, uh, racism, um, kids were often kind of uh, taught to shame their culture, weren't allowed to speak their language, and as a result there was a kind of a lot of uh, negative impacts that came out as a result of that. Um, the Australian uh, First Peoples, so the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, um, have a concept called the Stolen Generations. Um, so this is kind of a kind of group uh, th who, through very similar kind of uh, colonialistic policies, were kind of taken away from their families and had uh, kind of a, an analogous experience, um, kind of as a result, kind of experiencing you know that racism, um, kind of. Uh, the devaluation of their own culture. Some of them were, you know, for example, adopted by white families and tried to kind of um, make them seem more white culturally. Um, and that kind of had a lot of negative long-term impacts for kind of both groups. Um, we have this kind of idea of uh, trauma, right? So trauma can kind of have this very acute impact on people. You see something, something experiencing that's kind of very difficult for you, very hard. Um, and that can have a big impact both physically, mentally, emotionally, and bleed out into a, a variety of areas in your life. Now, there's another concept called intergenerational trauma that kind of plays in very big here. So my kind of very uh, simplified uh, version um, is basically this idea that kind of the effects of this acute trauma, so the people that are actually taken away from their families, the families themselves at the time, um, any kind of big event like that would impact um, any group reasonably in such a large way that it would uh, modulate any future actions, kind of how they went about interacting with their communities. It would affect the culture, the language, and have kind of a bleed down effect into future generations. So even if you're interacting with uh, people that uh, weren't directly kind of involved in these policies or weren't directly impacted, um, they were impacted kind of through this kind of mechanism. Um, so kind of understanding that is very important kind of to understand um, why issues such as um, uh, uh, disparities in uh, Aboriginal health are very important. Now this kind of comes into modern disadvantage. So there are a lot of kind of uh, struggles faced by First Peoples in various uh, areas around the world as a result of this um, kind of intergenerational trauma born out of uh, colonialistic policies. Um, and one of them um, kind of is mental health. And um, I gotta switch the slides again. Right, and so uh, mental health, uh, is one of those things that uh, has been linked to kind of this intergenerational trauma. And as a result, um, there's kind of this idea that uh, a lot of kind of first peoples around the world um, are kind of at a disadvantage and often suffer from uh, kind of greater degrees of concerns as a result. Um, now, this is important for a couple of reasons. So 
I'm going to first define mental health because I think that's going to be an important conversation. So the WHO definition, this World Health, Organi World Health Organization definition uh, of mental health is a state of well-being in which every individual realizes his or her own potential, can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to her or his community. Um, I think that's a good definition. Seems fair enough. Um, but um, one that uh, is kind of um, becoming more popular, and certainly among the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, is this concept of social and emotional well-being. So social and emotional well-being, and so in this culture, um, this kind of mental health, and this is kind of a similar kind of idea they're trying to get at, um, isn't really seen as kind of separate um, from your community, um, from kind of your social interactions, from the kind of uh, state you live in. Um, and so it's kind of, it steps a bit away um, from this idea of kind of a personal kind of state, a personal well-being. You cannot be well um, if your community isn't well. You cannot be well if you personally aren't well. But it's this kind of idea of how many, many, many different kind of factors have an interplay into your overall kind of uh, mental state, your well-being. And as a result, um, they're kind of all important kind of to differing degrees. So this is kind of um, what I'm going to be using kind of throughout the presentation, uh, but if you're kind of trying to translate it back into language you're used to, when I say so social and emotional well-being, I am talking kind of about mental health um, just in a slightly modified sense. Now, um, in the research uh, kind of out there now on development, it's, it's been shown kind of repeatedly that kind of what happens uh, during development, so you know, when you're two, when you're three, when you're four, when you're five, when you're growing up, right, um, has a huge impact on later outcomes. So these are outcomes uh, you know, just a couple years later, into your 20s, into your 30s, all the way kind of to the end of your life. So you can see kind of uh, the impact of those early experiences, the early exposures, the early environments you're in um, throughout your life. And one of these kind of components is mental health. So mental health specifically has been linked to a variety of different outcomes later on in life. Um, one example, so I just pulled that, I'm just going to pull out an example from Australia, is that mental health at the age of five, so this would be, what, first year of school, you're in kindergarten, if they're a Canadian, um, was predictive of actual standardized test scores at age 8, 10, and 12. So think like when they're writing your EQAO in grade 9, um, for the Ontarians out there, um, they could actually kind of uh, predict on average what your score could be based on what your mental health status was at age 5, or at least a correlation um, there. And so that's kind of very important because that kind of tells you, okay, so maybe, you know, treating mental health when you kind of have big kind of concerns at, you know, age 14, 15, 16, maybe isn't always the answer because maybe there's something that's been going on uh, for a long, long time. You need to have some resilience building kind of from the get-go. So as a result, uh, we decided that it was kind of very important to kind of take a look at what the mental health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Australian children was at school entry. So that would be age four, five, six, uh, same kind of uh, age as in Canada, um, and kind of take a look at what kind of factors were associated with that to see if we could find anything that would uh, makes sense to kind of modulate, to kind of get some policy intervention and so on. Um, so my method, so this was uh, a literature review, uh, but I kind of uh, tried to make it as systematic as possible. So uh, I started with a database review of kind of classic medical databases, so MBAS, Medline, uh, we had PsycInfo as well, uh, and a variety of great literature sources, including uh, Australian Indigenous Health InfoNet, the National Health and Medical Research Council website, uh, the Trove database, and there's a slew of others. I just wanted to put up a couple. Um, and the idea for searching so many things was that there isn't a ton of research out there on this. It's not a very kind of, uh, it's a very niche topic to look at uh, mental health and long-term developmental outcomes, especially in such a specific population. So we wanted to have a very sensitive search. So we figured searching many different databases would kind of be good for that. And um, that just meant I had more screening to do. Um, I translated my search criteria, I would say, into normal human English. Uh, so basically what all of the studies needed to have um, or the reports or uh, investigations was uh, something uh, regarding an investigation of social emotional well-being in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander youth at school entry. Um, and it would need to kind of provide information on one of these kind of factors. So first, how many kids are kind of um, suffering uh, from social emotional well-being concerns or conversely, how many are doing well. Um, what factors are associated with social emotional well-being? So at the time, so while you're measured, what's kind of associated socioeconomic status, housing, whatever the factors are, and uh, the link of that social emotional well-being to kind of later outcomes. So basically the same kind of stuff we've been talking about. Analysis, same thing. We're just looking at how many kids are kind of having concerns, how many are doing well, and what does the data say about factors associated with uh, that status at the time of measurement, and what is that kind of 
status indicate in the future. So I popped up a nice prism diagram. I hope that's big enough. If not, I'll kind of read it off. So um, we identified uh, 1135 uh, articles through database searching. After duplicates, we have 944. Um, with the 944, we did a title and abstract screening with that same criteria. Um, excluded 667, uh, moved on to 277 full text articles, uh, of which we excluded 248. Uh, it may seem actually that we have a lot of articles uh, excluded for an ineligible population, uh, so 200 of the 248. That's not because I was accidentally getting uh, kind of uh, different groups of people, but often we had to exclude people because of ages, so we'd get school entry to high school or something like that, so we'd have a lot of that. Um, so that's kind of uh, one of the downfalls of a uh, sensitive search is that you have a lot of that. And then we uh, exclude the rest because they weren't investigating uh, social emotional well-being or uh, the full text wasn't available. Um, so you'll see here I have two boxes that say papers included in review, N equals 35. Uh, the one on the right is actually supposed to say uh, hand search, uh, and we added six articles based on that. Uh, my kind of only <laughs> kind of excuse for that is that you should fire the person that made the slides, so me. Um, <laughs> that's okay. But uh, other than that, so we added six articles based on kind of uh, reference scans of the included articles. We found a couple extra, and then we ended with 35 total articles. Um, all right. So the results. So I'm going to kind of quickly go over this because this is um, not particularly novel. So this was the how many children have social emotional well-being concerns or how many were doing well. So this is something that's very well researched in the Australian uh, context. So we had a variety of different studies feeding in. So we had the Western Australian Aboriginal Child Health Survey. So that's just cross-sectional, did it one time in the state of Western Australia. The search study, so that's run out of the Sachs Institute. So that isn't going to be cross-sectional, so they're going to be doing more data collection. But as of now, only the baseline data is published, so in effect, it's cross-sectional. Um, we had the longitudinal study of indigenous children and the longitudinal study of Australian children, which is just kind of, um, they grab samples from across Australia to make it representative and follow those kids long term. So those were actually the only longitudinal studies you could find uh, related to um, social and emotional well-being in uh, Australian children. So that kind of tells you a lot. Um, we had the student health entrant questionnaire, which they give to all children entering um, school in Victoria. So that's uh, down where Melbourne is. Um, and the Australian Early Development Census, which, fun fact, is based off of the Early Development uh, Index, which is, I believe, a McMaster thing from the Alfred Center. So there you go. Um, so the trend here, um, kind of unsurprising uh, based on the literature, was that very low numbers of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander uh, children um, had mental health concerns or were at high risk for having these concerns. Um, so that's kind of similar to normal Australian children. But the difference was their risk of being uh, of having these mental health concerns was significantly higher. So even though the absolute number was very low, um, their risk was significantly higher. Um, and usually kind of the significance on those tests was kind of under, you know, the p-value was under uh, 0 0.01 or under 0 0.001. So these were generally like very, very, very high risk um, kind of situations. Uh, I will note there, there is a lot of kind of problems looking at um, these uh, kind of results because there's often different cutoffs used for tools. And even if the tools were the same, and they often kind of modified tools. So they'd take in, you know, take out a question, add a different question. Maybe they'd get a cultural consultant to come in and deliver the tool. Maybe they'd just have a researcher. Maybe it'd be the doctor that does it. So even though, you know, uh, we have a decent amount of studies here and uh, a good amount of data, it was, it's, not, it's not really comparing apples to apples in a sense. And so kind of uh, any result should be taken with a grain of salt. But uh, that's just kind of my... Uh, kind of acknowledgement there. So this is a very busy slide. And so um, I'm going to walk you through it very slowly. So uh, James, can they see my cursor if I put it over the screen? OK. So basically, uh, I'm just going to get you to look at that top line uh, uh, on the y-axis that says child has sleep problems. OK, so child has sleep problems too, OK? So this is the factors associated with mental health. So what I'm saying here is two studies, that's where the two comes from report uh, assessed whether the factor of a child having sleep problems is associated with mental health. And if you see, kind of on the x-axis is the percentage, so proportion, you can see that 100% of these two studies said that it was associated significantly with poor mental health. Okay, so that means all two of the two said that. If you go down to the next line, care is primarily engaged in home duties, one. Okay, out of the one study, one study said that it was poorly associated with mental health. So you can kind of sense a trend here. So if I go maybe down to some of the kind of the green areas, which are the good mental health, you go all the way to the bottom, 
you can see care social emotional well-being, so care mental health, was associated significantly with the child's mental health at school entry uh, in 100% of both cases. So two things come out here. Um, one is that uh, there's kind of a, generally a very clear dichotomy of uh, factors. So you have most of them kind of very clearly falling on this is a poor mental health kind of concern and this is a good mental health kind of factor. But the problem is, as you can see, there's very few kind of studies or very few cohorts involved. Um, and that's kind of indicative of kind of the lack of research in this context. But the kind of nice thing about this, despite that, so kind of the kind of silver lining here, is that it does give you a kind of a good point to kind of leap off and say, all right, so where should we maybe be looking kind of in future research, kind of where should the next line of inquiry be? So it's, it's unfortunate that there isn't a lot of information, but it does give a good starting point, kind of, kind of tells you where we are. Um, and then there was a long other list of factors that there was no association at all, uh, probably like two times longer than this chart, so I didn't include it, but this is kind of all the ones that were significant at all. And then the sad part, so the last one is what long-term outcomes were associated with mental health at school entry. Um, there is a very, very little uh, out here, definitely not enough to put in a chart. And basically, all I would say about this is that um, this kind of research, there's a lot of problems kind of um, with conducting uh, uh, this kind of uh, study that kind of lead it to not be um, very common uh, in the field of mental health, kind of getting things like, you know, follow-up, having a small population, things like that. Uh, but the result is that despite the fact that we know that uh, development is important, kind of developmental kind of exposures are important to later outcomes, and mental health is presumably one of those very important exposures, we can't find out or we can't see based on a kind of current research um, what actually uh, the outcomes are and how serious they are. Maybe they're more serious. Maybe the association is greater than in the average Australian, or maybe it's less. Um, and so unfortunately, you can't really tease that out. Um, and then kind of the second problem is that even the studies that we're looking at, it, so say the longitudinal study of Australian children, longitudinal study of indigenous children, they're the only two longitudinal studies um, that have really been done on the topic, they don't focus on mental health. So while when you have such a broad uh, kind of study, so they're collecting data on housing and, you know, uh, work status and where you live and a bunch of different factors, you don't get the deep dive uh, often necessary to kind of tease out um, individual small factors. So you'll get a lot of information on the proportion of kids in wave one had, uh, you know, 20 percent had social emotional well-being concerns, but you won't get a good uh, teasing out of, well, it was associated with mother's education or it was associated with, um, you know, uh, par parenting style, um, at least not to the degree you would if these were focused solely on mental health. All right. So thoughts and next steps. So I've kind of woven this in anyway. But the kind of clear next step here is to obviously investigate the long-term outcomes of mental health. Uh, in general, it's, it's definitely a thin area, but especially in the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders population, and especially because of the history and kind of what the research shows that this is potentially an even bigger concern than in the average population, and this is definitely a huge concern in the average uh, population of youth. Um, that's kind of, kind of impetus to kind of hopefully do that in the future. Um, this is also kind of potential um, to kind of start kind of thinking of potential investments in mental health at a younger age. We often talk about, even here at university, getting more counselors for the university students or uh, investing in mental health counselors for high schools. But um, kind of the research out there, despite the common discourse, is kind of showing that potentially this is something that we should start thinking about when kids are four, when they're five, who knows how young, right? And so this kind of, um, hopefully kind of some uh, impetus to kind of start those conversations and start thinking, even if it doesn't provide uh, enough evidence at this point to say you definitely need to do something. Um, it can definitely, uh, I think, serve as uh, motivation to maybe at least look at those things. And then the last point is kind of important, and it's to continue to work with communities to come up with culturally relevant and appropriate solutions to the concerns they identify as important. So that's wordy, and I'm sorry, <laughs> but basically um, what I'm just trying to say here, and this was kind of a big part of kind of um, my learning this summer, was that um, Oftentimes, uh, as researchers, uh, as policy workers, and things like that, you often want to kind of go in and kind of solve problems for people. But it's often not the best way to kind of go about doing it, because if you don't have the buy-in coming back from the people, it doesn't matter how interesting, how novel, how effective your kind of outcome is, um, or your research idea is, um, if they're not kind of buying in in the first place. And uh, even if it was effective, you kind of might kind of turn them away from further opportunities. So this kind of idea of kind of uh, engaging in research in partnership with people, where you kind of come to the table kind of um, with ideas, with your experience, um, you know, with an open mind, and 
expecting to learn from them back. Um, that's the kind of way to kind of, uh, first of all, go about getting a lot of buy-in into your research, um, getting research done in an effective way, but um, also kind of sustaining long-term research partnerships. So that's something I just wanted to toss in. I didn't know where to toss there. But um, so the last thing, um, a quick acknowledgement. Um, so I would like to thank uh, the individuals at the Sachs Institute uh, who took me in the summer, were very welcoming, and guided my learning. Uh, of course, uh, my supervisor, Anna Williamson, was a huge influence um, on me. Um, I think I learned uh, more than I uh, could have possibly expected from her and um, a lot of different ways of looking at things in great perspectives, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Deanna and Janice from the search team. Um, so I was working on uh, some projects with the search team, and kind of they were kind of uh, my supports on that, and we were working together in collaboration, and um, that was an excellent experience as well. And of course, to the rest of the knowledge exchange and search teams um, at SACS, who I spent a lot of time with. Um, kind of secondarily, I also want to do a quick thank you to James and Health Forum uh, for supporting me through this process and for even providing me this opportunity. And um, by extension to the Queen Elizabeth Scholars Program in general, I think the program is um, understated in how important it is. Um, uh, kind of just kind of in our normal conversations. I think um, going uh, to other cultures, learning, experiencing, growing with them is, I think, the only way um, to to really break down walls, break down barriers, and kind of learn to kind of see things from a different perspective. Um, I open my eyes, I open my mind, and I learn so much more in three months than I have, and I think three months anywhere else in my life, and I think I'm very thankful for that. Um, and it's not content necessarily, it was kind of a way of looking at things, a perspective, a way of approaching uh, new people and problems. And so uh, for that reason, I definitely encourage um, anyone watching that's considering applying to come out and do so, uh, and I would like to thank everyone who supports the program. Now, a uh, quick reference to slide if you're interested. Um, if you are interested in any of the studies I talked about, um, you can go to these references slides, but honestly, it's better off if you message me. I have a ton of great resources I can send to you. Um, and if you want to talk to me about any of my other work, um, I worked with the search team a little bit um, and did a couple other projects, I can do that as well. So thank you very much. All right, here you go. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael. That was wonderful. So we'll uh, open it up to questions now. Uh, for anybody who's in the room, uh, feel free to raise your hand, and uh, I will uh, repeat your question for those uh, online and for the sake of the recording later. If you are joining us online, I'm going to ask that you please type your questions into the chat box, and again, I will read them off for the sake of the recording. Uh, I will start things off um, while people are thinking about their questions, Michael. So. Um, it was interesting, probably not a huge surprise, not a lot of these children, but at a higher risk uh, compared to the rest of the children. So uh, I'm going to ask you a very health systems related question in, in regards to that. So, um, you know, obviously there's a need there. There's something in the system that needs to be done to help these children. Um, do you know if uh, Australia is doing anything within their system to try to, you know, lessen the risk of these children? And if not, where do you think they should uh, be focusing their efforts? OK, uh, thank you, James. Yeah, I'll just take it. I'll stand over here. Um, so there's kind of a couple things to think about with that. So kind of similar to Canada, like the health system isn't always, you can't think of it always necessarily as Australia, right? It's, it's often broken down into kind of many little pieces. So you get a lot of things on the state level. Um, you get a lot of things on the local level. Um, what I will say, because um, I'm definitely um, not a, the expert on this, is that a lot of the efforts I personally kind of uh, was witness to were a lot of kind of like more smaller grassroots levels. So you'd see things at the level of um, uh, the AMS, so the Aboriginal Medical Services, which are housed within the Aboriginal Community Controlled Health Services, similar to our AHACs in Ontario. So you'd see a lot of efforts there. So um, an example could be uh, with the search team. So the search team is actually partnered with um, several of these uh, Aboriginal medical services kind of across New South Wales. And the kind of idea is that they're going to be partnering together to kind of solve issues within their communities, which includes mental health. And the kind of idea is they want to get good information, kind of get, uh, get good research done, kind of solving some of these hopeful problems, and kind of see what they can do as a result of that. Um, what I kind of saw, because I got to go out to some of these uh, Aboriginal medical services, is like a lot of individuals having to fight for more resources, having to kind of fight for more change. And um, I, I can't personally say I had a ton of experience on kind of the upper levels, but I did see a lot of kind of grassroots efforts and a lot of smaller kind of, you know, uh, level efforts. So, and I think that's kind of very promising um, with a lot of um, purposeful engagement of policymakers along the way, which is kind of really cool. Um, 
Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question from somebody online. Um, what would you say your biggest challenge was when conducting the literature review? Yeah, for sure. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think I think this is kind of a, maybe a general answer, but it's definitely an honest one. Is I think whenever you go into a situation where um, I know that by definition my knowledge going in is way less than it's than it kind of needs to be. I think that there was a lot of catch up that had to happen. So I've done systematic reviews in the past, and um, which is kind of a similar idea. You know, you're creating your kind of search strategy and so on. But the difference was with those, I already kind of had an idea of what I was looking for. I knew exactly what I was kind of thinking about and looking for. But for me, um, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders peoples, the uh, the Australia in general, mental health, social emotional well being, these are all kind of new things for me. So there was a very kind of like I had to very have a very deep dive into literature before I could even know what I was looking for. And so for me, that was very hard. I had a lot of the methodologies kind of in my back pocket from previous uh, work, but um, I think that was very hard. And going into it with an open mind uh, was very helpful. Um, but, you know, it was just like a lot of learning, uh, very humbling how little I knew and how little I think I still know. But um, that was definitely probably the hardest part. And I think that would probably be something that would be similarly difficult for most QE scholars going health systems abroad is the big problem is you don't have a lot of experience. So um, I think gaining that was the sharp learning curve there. Thank you. Uh, any other questions from, if you're online again, please type your question in the chat box. If you're in the room with us, uh, please put your hand up. Um, I will ask another question while people are thinking. So uh, you're now a, a medical student. Uh, you've done now a large topic in another country looking at mental health concerns, um, looking at a very specific population in their Aboriginal population. So how has this experience and what you've learned through all this uh, going to shape your future as a physician? Yeah, thank you, James. Um, I think, uh, and this is kind of what I was trying to get at with the like last bit of my presentation uh, when I was kind of talking about the importance of the program, is I think that experiences like this, so um, I'm just going to give an example even outside of my uh, work. So the place I lived at, I lived with people from all across the world. I was looking at people from Belgium, from Germany, from Britain, from Saudi Arabia, from Brazil, from Spain, from um, Argentina, from Switzerland, like all over the place. And I think um, that kind of diversity, by definition diverse, right, um, is kind of the extreme example of me having to learn to work with, understand, coming, come into things with an open mind, open perspective, because people were not raised in the same way I, I was. Not everyone grew up in Newmarket, Ontario, or the GTA. And so I think taking that, whenever I see a, a new patient, I think I'm going to take those lessons, go in, and um, hopefully come in with an open mind. Not everyone comes from the same circumstances as me, even though we often end up surrounding ourselves with those people. Um, as clinicians, um, we often um, uh, forget kind of going in that we're not dealing with, you know, the 20 people that lived on our block. The healthy, you know, um, well-off people don't go to the doctors as much, and there's a lot of <laughs> um, social determinant kind of reasons for that. And so you're going to be interacting with a lot of people that you may not have kind of otherwise seen. And I think um, this kind of uh, way of going about things will be helpful in that regard. And hopefully the patients think so too. <laughs> Thank you. So I'll put out one last call for anybody who has questions. Everybody in the room is shaking their heads. So I think you've, uh, Michael had a nice conversation with people beforehand. So I, I think everybody's good. Uh, we have, oh, another question has popped up online. So let's just, uh, we'll cover that one. So how different or similar are the delivery of healthcare services to Aboriginals in Australia compared to Canada? That's an interesting question. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I would say that um, there are more similarities than differences. Um, so because of Australia's health system, it's different, but one of the, I would say, more similar ones to Canada is so you have a similar-ish basic structure and kind of the, the delivery of services, so an Aboriginal person, same as in Canada, um, can go to you know, any clinic, any hospital, but they also kind of have specific um, uh, targeted funding uh, to kind of provide care to these people and to provide uh, services outside of care, so you know, uh, you know, social programming, things like that. Um, and so that's why I actually brought up the example earlier. So they have uh, Aboriginal medical services housed in their Aboriginal community-controlled health services. Um, similar to our Aboriginal Health Access Center. So 
kind of analogous. Um, the care, I would say, uh, may differ in some respects because, for example, uh, the majority of uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people, like vast, vast majority, live in urban areas, right? So that's, you're not trying to provide care out on a ton of, uh, for example, reserves. They definitely still have uh, a ton of people living in remote communities, and often the outcomes are the most dramatic in those people, but there's the large, large majority of things going on in urban communities, so that's actually kind of what search was focused on because that's a very under-researched thing. Everyone, um, for some reason, uh, tends to kind of assume, um, oh, we need to kind of treat these kind of remote people out that we never see, but the vast majority are just walking down the street, same as everyone else. So. Um, there is, I would say, more similarities than differences, but um, there are some kind of subtle, subtle nuances, but more due to Australia and I think less due to kind of how they're trying to deal with care. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I'm, I'm going to guess that we are probably uh, coming to the end, um, so I'm going to uh, wrap it up. Uh, unless somebody jumps in at the last minute here, but I will just move to our last slide to thank you, Michael, for uh, spending uh, some time with us today to talk about your experience at the Sachs Institute uh, in the search program. Uh, very interesting. Um, we've had students go to Sachs, and they always seem to do something slightly different, so it's always interesting to hear uh, the work that's being done there uh, and how translatable it is back to Canada. Um, so thank you very much for that. Thank you for those of you who have joined us here today. We do appreciate you uh, coming in. Uh, on the screen, there are some links I'm just going to draw your attention to. Uh, the first one is just information about our Queen Elizabeth Scholarship Program. If you're interested in it, uh, feel free to check out that link. Uh, the second link is a link, list of our webinars. So uh, all of our scholars who went away in the summertime are doing uh, uh, webinars throughout this, this term, so from now until December the 13th. So please visit that link, uh, take a look at the list of webinars, and please uh, join us, tell your friends. Uh, and then the third link is a link to our blog page. So all of our uh, scholars also write blogs uh, about a little bit more of the personal side of their experiences. Uh, so please uh, visit that, read uh, what they have to say. Um, it's very interesting. Everybody had something, you know, everybody's experienced it in different ways. So it's, it's nice to hear uh, the different voices come through there. So thank you again, Michael, for joining us. Thank you, those of you who uh, joined us here in the room at the McMaster Health Forum and join us online. And uh, we will hope to see you all again soon. Thank you.